I'm Taylor. And I'm Tyler. And I'm Kerry. This is Book of Mormon Central's Come Follow Me Insights. Today, a special episode from our friend Kerry Milstein, who is an expert on the Book of Abraham. We're going to turn the time over to him, and this will be a delightful learning experience for you to learn from one of the experts about what the Book of Abraham is and all the amazing things that it teaches us about God, as well as asking some of the hard questions, giving us some information, additional resources about um, what the book is, why it matters, and helping us to make sense of the some of the difficult aspects of the Book of Abraham. So as we jump into this episode two, you're in for a real treat. Uh, Kerry Milstein is one of our world's experts on the Book of Abraham, and you've studied this for many years, a couple from decades. every angle, and and there's nothing that that uh, you've heard or read on the internet that's caused people concern that that Kerry would say, well, "Oh, I I didn't know about that. I I was not aware of that question or that concern." So. This is going to be a, a wonderful opportunity for you to get kind of an overview of the whole book of Abraham. Where did we get it? What, what is the history of the book, and how did it come to, to be? And then some of the questions that surround maybe its provenance, its its genesis. Where did we where did we get it, and what does it entail for us? As well as then, what are some of the unique and beautiful cosmic doctrines that are added to our scriptural canon? through the Book of Abraham. So, Kerry, let's jump in. Where Book of Abraham, where where did it come from? So, uh, you know, it comes from Abraham. There are a lot of things we don't know, and that's one of the things you're going to find, is there are a lot of things we don't know and a lot of things we do know, which is true of the Bible as well. We just don't talk about that as much with the Bible. Uh, there are a lot of things we don't know exactly how we got this and, and so on. We just have a later copy of it, right? That's what we have with the Book of Abraham. We know Abraham writes the original. Uh, I don't know when, I don't know what on, is he writing this on papyrus, parchment, clay tablets, I don't know what he writes it on, um, but he writes it, and we don't know how it's transmitted over time. We know that uh, any ancient document, it's not going to last that long, and so uh, any any co ancient document we have now, uh, there, it's very, very rare that we have the original, and we don't have the original for any scriptural books. <clears throat> we have a copy of a copy of a copy. And that's true of most ancient stories uh, or anything along those lines. We have the copy of the copy of the copy. So I don't know who does the copying. I don't know when the copying happens. I don't know when or how it comes into Egypt. Um, Abraham was in Egypt for a while, but I suspect that at least part of this book he writes after he's come back out of Egypt, probably most of it or maybe all of it. Um, he has descendants that go to Egypt, right? His uh, great-grandson Joseph goes, and then the whole family goes down there. They're there for a long time. Is that when the writings come and they stay there? I don't know. We get the kingdom of Israel and Judah being established, and they have people going back and forth to Egypt. Uh, in fact, when um, the Jerusalem is destroyed in Jeremiah's day, Jeremiah is taken to Egypt. There's a big group of Jews that go down. Jeremiah dies in Egypt, and there's a group of Jews there from that time forward, uh, and we get more and more and more of them so that you get a really significant Jewish population in Egypt uh, for, for really from the time of the, the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, and it just gets larger and larger. And there are all sorts of parts of Egypt. You get two temples being built in Egypt, Jewish temples, right? Temples to Jehovah. Um, so somewhere along there, you've got someone who brings writings of Abraham in there. And I don't know when or how. Um, but, which, which, by the way, is very helpful to understand because some of the some of the attacks against the Book of Abraham say, well, Abraham could never have written these papyri because they don't date far enough back to to hit Abraham's time. Yeah, yeah, which is silly. I mean, so just to give you an example, that we can date the papyri that Joseph Smith ended up with to about 200 BC. All right, Abraham lives about 2000 BC, so that's a bit of a gap, right? But just as an example. The earliest copy of the book of Isaiah we have is also from 200 B.C. Isaiah lived about 700 B.C. 700, 750 is that, that range there for him. So, uh, I mean, they're both removed, right? That's just standard. That's how it works. And, and when no one says, well, this is in Isaiah's writings because this date's too late, it, it's a copy of a copy of a copy. So that's how it is. He says, says written by his own hand. The text was written by his own hand. And if you're a scribe, that's what you write down. Uh, and you copy that again and again. Not the manuscript that you're creating is written by his own hand, but the original text is written by Abraham's hand. That's right? very helpful. So how did Joseph Smith come into possession of, of papyri? 
Great, great question. And, and to some degree, the question is, how does the story get on the particular papyri Joseph Smith ends up with, right? So I said we can date this to about 200 BC. That's because we know that the, the papyrus fragment that has the original that facsimile one is a facsimile of, right? So that original drawing, the, the person who, whose papyrus that was, he had his name on there, his father's name, his priestly titles. It's someone that we know well enough we can actually go trace his genealogy back a few generations and down several generations. We know who he is. We know where he is. We know what he does. Um, and so he's a priest in Thebes. Interestingly enough, a priest in Thebes who is interested in um, rituals that have to do with uh, slaying people who disrupt the religious order of things, interested in rituals that protect people, uh, or, or, yeah, yeah, that protect people interested in creation accounts and astronomy, all of which is in the Book of it's Abraham, right? There. So, and we know he has a role in all of those things, so it would make sense he's interested in the Book of Abraham. We also know that priests in Thebes at the same time period where he was a priest in Thebes uh, are collecting stories about Greek gods, Mesopotamian gods, Jewish god, and Jewish characters. We know they collected stories about Abraham and Moses. So, uh, it would be no surprise that he might be interested in a text that's a story about Abraham that, that touches on all these things. So, he has these papyri. They're buried with him around 200 BC, and that's the end of the story for a long time. And the story picks back up when Napoleon invades Egypt. And as Napoleon invades Egypt, the, the Egypt has really been closed to the Western world for a very long time. It's part of the Ottoman Empire. Um, the British help the, the ally with the Ottomans to go kick the, the French out of Egypt because the British and the French are fighting each other anywhere they can find the chance. So they, uh, they, they kick them out, but suddenly Egypt is open to Westerners. And you get a whole bunch of people who are working for, say, the British government and the French government in particular, but other governments as well, European countries, that are going into Egypt and getting antiquities and just bringing them out. So some of the guys that are doing this, this is when we get the big collection in the British Museum, in the Louvre, in the Turin Museum, in the Berlin Museum. And some of the characters that are involved in getting um, the collection that's in the Louvre and the, the, um, the uh, Turin Museum, also, one of them is named Antonio Lebelo. And he also uh, has a time period where he's selling things just as an individual rather than to these governments and so on. And so he has a collection of mummies and papyri that he's uh, shipping home to be sold. He dies, but they end up being shipped to America and uh, someone buys them in America and they take them around and they're showing them in town to town, charging people 25 cents to come see them. And uh, after a, a while of doing that, they seem to have made the money they're going to make. They're kind of trying to unload these things, and so they start selling off the mummies. And eventually it gets down to four mummies and a couple of large scrolls and fragments of papyrus. And this makes its way to Kirtland, where Joseph Smith uh, sees them, uh, feels very impressed that they should acquire the papyri. They won't sell the mummies separate from the papyri, so he raises the funds. This is 1835. July of 1835 in Kirtland, he raises the funds, and they, they purchase the papyri and the mummies. So that's how we end up with them. Little did he know what he was buying at that point, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he may have had some inklings or something, but uh, because what we're told is that the very first day, he's, he, he comes and he meets Michael Chandler's the person that brings them to Kirtland to sell them. And he meets Michael Chandler, um, and he's given permission to take them home, and he looks at them, and he comes back the next day, and he's got quite a bit of translation done already. Oliver Cowdery reads from the translation, um, and so he may have had an inkling. I don't know what part he's, he's reading from. I don't know if he's translated the Book of Abraham part or the book. Uh, I, we, we just don't know. Which we know scroll? somewhere in there he says he learns that the writings of Abraham and of Joseph are on the papyri. I don't know if that's the first day or two days later. I, I, I just don't know. Uh, we, can't, we don't have enough information to tell. And again, that's one of the things I would stress, that there are a lot of elements of the story that we don't know, and that's worth keeping track of. Which is important because sometimes you read you read antagonistic things about the Book of Abraham, and often they're straw man arguments that are being made where yeah. they'll, they'll make a claim, the, the premise of which is not true, and then they'll draw the conclusions of, see, it's all a fr yeah. It's like you can't make many of the claims that are being made. Yeah, no, you're right. They're almost all based on false assumptions. Yeah. Right? So, and some of that becomes apparent as we re go through kind of the story, right? So Joseph translates quite a bit and maybe all and maybe even more than what we have in Kirtland. We're not sure whether it's uh, part, all, or more. Um, 
And he does that just through the end of 1835. Then nothing happens on them for a long time. Eventually, there's some fun stories involved in here, but they eventually make their way to Nauvoo, as Joseph does. And uh, in 1842, he's ready to publish them because he becomes the editor of the Times and Seasons, and he uses that opportunity to publish the Book of Abraham. He, he may do a little bit more translating then, or it may be kind of translating as a, a form of revising. I suspect, I don't know, we really can't tell, but I suspect he translated everything we have and probably more in 1835, but, but maybe not. And that what's happening in 1842 is some uh, revising and insertion of, of Hebrew that he's learned in the, in the meantime and so on. In the end, we can't tell. Um, but he publishes it in 1842. Uh, and he always says he wants to publish more, but he never gets around to it. And if it feels to you like Abraham chapter 5 ends in the middle, that's because it does, right? He's not done. It's not the end of the book. There's more. That's just how far he got published at that point. Um, when Joseph dies, his mother continues to show the mummies and papyri for a fee. She's been doing that since, they, since Quincy, while Joseph was in Liberty Jail. She was doing that, and that's how she supported herself for all these years. And she continues to do that. When she um, passes away, Emma sells them uh, to a man named Abel Combs, who sells the, the mummies and the large, the two rolls, there's a large roll and a shorter roll, but they're both fairly large, um, sells those to the St. Louis Museum, who shows them for a while, then they sell them to a museum in Chicago, and they show them for a while, and then the Great Chicago Fire happens, and, and they burn. Yeah, the mummies and papyri burn. Um, well, we only know of two mummies there. We don't know what happened to the other two mummies. So, I mean, if you find them, I'd, I'd be interested in knowing. But anyway, um, and for a long time, we thought that was all of them. It was all of the, the papyri, uh, everything that they had. But uh, it turns out that wasn't the case. It turns out that Abel Combs, the, one, the man who bought them from Emma Smith, uh, he'd given some mounted fragments. So there were some fragments that had been cut off presumably because they were on the outside of these scrolls. We don't know for sure, but often you, you cut, that's the part that gets worn the most, the outermost uh, winding. And so uh, it, it may be that they're cut from the scrolls, but one way or the other, they're, they're fairly damaged, and so they've been cut off, they've been glued to paper and mounted under glass. And he seems to have given those fragments to his housekeeper, I presume as payment, I don't know, she never gets anything out of them. Um, her daughter inherits them, her daughter tries to sell them to the Metropolitan Museum in New York, uh, initially, they're not interested, but later on, they are interested, like 20 years later. Um, and so they work with her son um, to acquire these papyri, and, uh, and they do. And uh, they recognize right away that these are the papyri Joseph Smith owned for a few reasons, partially because there's a receipt from Emma Smith that says these are the papyri that her, her <laughs> husband owned, but also facsimile one is on there and some other things. So. Um, it's 20 years after they acquire them that really these come to light again when uh, an Egyptian scholar that's teaching at the University of Utah is doing some research in the Metropolitan Museum of New York, and, uh, and he offers to be kind of a go-between between the Met and the church, and the, the, the Met gifts these papyrus fragments to the church. And this is where some of the controversy starts, because we do have one of the papyrus fragments does have the original of facsimile one, and there's some text around it. So everyone makes the assumption that Joseph Smith is translating from the text adjacent to facsimile one, the, the stuff that's right next to that, that drawing, right? That's a natural assumption. I, sure. I can see you, you thinking that. Um, and by now, we can translate Egyptian, right? So we translate Egyptian. This is in 1967. Hugh Nibley's the one that, that uh, starts to work on this right away and uh, recognizes that it's a, a copy of what is known as the Book of Breathings. It's a, an Egyptian funerary document designed to help you get where you want to be in the afterlife in the state you want to be in. Interestingly, it has uh, some creation and, and protection motifs. Uh, it's actually kind of similar in content to, in some ways to the Book of Abraham. Obviously a different story, but similar purpose in some ways. In any case, uh, so if you are going with the assumption that they have translated from the text that is adjacent to that drawing, and then we translate that text, and it's not the Book of Breathings, then you say, oh, Joseph Smith is wrong. You messed up. Yeah. Um, but uh, the problem is that most people didn't recognize that was an assumption, they, and that's what you'll still hear today. People will say, this is what he translated from, and that's not what it says. And we have to, if we're going to be honest, intellectually honest uh, researchers, we have to say, that's an assumption and test the assumption. And we won't get into all the different ways you can test it, but I've, I've tried to test this and so have others a number of different ways. 
And uh, the, uh, some of the ways you test it tell you it, it may or may not be a good assumption. Some of the ways say it's probably not a good assumption. And one of the ways, looking at the eyewitnesses, it's almost certainly wrong. Um, it, I mean, like you have to twist what the eyewitnesses are saying and, and not take them at their word to uh, think that Joseph is translating from that because they talk about him translating from the large role. Even after these fragments are mended under glass, they talk about him translating from the large role. Right. So, so we can say that that assumption was wrong, uh, that Joseph is translating from elsewhere. And that gets us into the question of how is Joseph translating? Yeah, we use the word translate to usually mean you've got a source language and then a destination language, and you know both of them, and so you bring text from one language into this, in our case, English, which means Joseph would have to be an Egyptologist as well as a good English yeah. grammarian, and, and I'm not neither. sure he's neither, yeah, yeah, he's, <laughs> if, he's, he's, if neither. he's either one. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. So let's, let's walk through this a little bit, Tyler, and you can help me with this. Uh, let's, he doesn't tell us really anything about the translation process. He doesn't really with the Book of Mormon either. He, he never does. He doesn't let us into the back room yeah. of the translation process on and any of there's, this. There's a part of me that thinks it's because it's such a, a heavenly uh, and out-of-this-world experience that he really can't describe it and he may not fully understand it himself, right? It's, it's something that's – it's the power of God and he knows it's working. I, I would have a hard time describing to you my inspirational experiences, mm -hmm. right? They're, they're not that easy to describe. So I, I think that may be part of why in the end I don't know. But let's say, okay, Book of Mormon, you just described our, how we usually think of translation, right? Got a text in one language, you give a text in another language. How does the Book of Mormon compare with that? What happens with the Book of Mormon? So it's fascinating because Joseph gets these plates that are written in, we find out later, Reformed Egyptian, early on it says in the language of the Egyptians, Joseph doesn't know the first thing about Egyptian at that point, right. and so it's revealed by the gift and power of God on the Urman Thummim and later on the, the Seer Stone, this idea of God brings these words to light because Joseph is not an Egyptologist. Right. He cannot translate that record. So in this case, the, the, the text is actually physically present. Joseph doesn't know how to read it. God gives him a translation, and often he's not even looking at the actual text, right? It's just happening through a different process, a revelatory process, right? Yeah. So that's one of his translation projects. The next one is what we call the – what Joseph called the new translation of the Bible. We call it the Joseph Smith translation. How does that – process stack up with what we, you know, our, our kind of standard idea. Yeah, that's beautiful because he has a, a King James version of the Bible in English, so it's it's not really a translation because yeah. it's already in English. not the way we use not, the word. Not the yeah. way we traditionally use that word. And he's reading through it and he's making edits and cutting words and adding entire sections to it as moved upon by heaven. That's what a prophet does. He, yep. he makes the word of God more accessible, more understandable, revealing things past, present, future, things which are hidden. Yeah, and the, and the book of Moses, right, all of this text, all of this is stuff that he's giving us that's not in his original text, right? He's looking at a King James Bible and these would be just blank pages if we were <laughs> – they were pages in the King James Bible, right, just completely blank. All of this is stuff that's not in the original text that he is giving us as pure revelation from God, right? right? And that's one of his translation projects. There is another one we don't talk about very often, and that's in section 7. Oh, yeah. right, so section 7, yeah. he sees a parchment that John wrote. I don't know if he even sees what's written on there. If he, if he does, and I, it could have been written in, say, Aramaic, it might have been written in Greek, we don't know, but Joseph doesn't know either one of those languages. He, I was going to say, either way, you're stuck if you're Joseph because you don't know either one. Yeah, and, and you don't ever actually physically have the text, and I'm not sure, he just, it seems like he just sees the parchment. I don't know that he actually sees the writing on the parchment, but, but still he gives us a translation of part of it, right? Yeah. So with the book of Abraham, is it one of those processes or something completely different? And the answer is we don't know. It could be that he's got this written on the papyrus, and he certainly talks that way. He talks about it being written on the papyrus in a language he doesn't know, and then through inspiration, and perhaps using the seer stone, which they call the Urim and Thummim. In, in the 1842 Nauvoo period, they talk about him using it in connection with the Book of Abraham. We don't really have people talking about it in the Kirtland period. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. I don't know. But, but through a revelatory process, and that's the descriptions we get from those who are working with him, inspira direct inspiration from heaven is a phrase that we get, all right? Um, he gives us this text, perhaps a text that's written on the papyrus, and he gives it in, in Egyptian, and 
or, or actually, Oliver Cowdery says some of the letters look a little bit like Hebrew. Oliver Cowdery kind of knew Hebrew at the time. He may or may not know what he's talking about, so maybe it's some Hebrew writing on the text. I don't know, but it, it's a language he doesn't know, and he gives it to us in English, all right? That's one of the possibilities. If so, then what that tells us, and this is called the missing papyrus theory, that the papyrus that it was written on, which would presumably, based on the eyewitness accounts, be these long, this long roll, yeah, was burned, right? So it's missing. We don't have it any, any longer. Is that the source of the book of Abraham? There's a pretty good chance. Joseph seems to, to talk in a way that that's, makes me think that there's a good chance that's it. But it's also possible it's like the book of Moses, right, where he's got this papyrus text, and as he's looking at it, he receives inspiration about a real text that exists that is a historical record of Abraham that isn't even on the papyri. That has, maybe has nothing to do with that. Yeah, and it may be that this just serves to focus him, his mind and open it to inspiration, kind of like the Urim and Thummim does, right? Often people call this the catalyst theory, that the papyri serve as a catalyst to his receiving revelation, right? It's possible. If so, Joseph talks about the writings being on the papyri, so if that's the case, then Joseph has just made himself made an assumption about this, that is, a, he's mistaken, right? It's not, he's not making an assumption about what it says. He's getting that through revelation, but he could make an assumption about where he's getting it from, and God doesn't feel like he needs to correct him. And it could be some of both, right? He's, he, he, there's some language that indicates revelatory. It says they're looking on this alphabet and grammar that they're working on, and, um, and the principles of astronomy is uh, understood by the ancients unfolded through them, right? That sounds revelatory. So, so you use the phrase alphabet and grammar. Right. Probably a new phrase to most of you who haven't heard this. It's that idea that after Joseph had completed the Book of Mormon translation, he he knows from the English translation we get that it's it's Egyptian, it's Reformed Egyptian. He becomes fascinated with all things Egyptian, and he's trying his best to learn Egyptian. But would you say he ever becomes an Egyptologist? No, no, <laughs> no. It's clear he's he he doesn't. Um, and what we have are some documents. So this is another thing people will, will wonder, uh, members of the church, believers and non-believers. We get uh, several documents, uh, a, a set of three that are written by Oliver W.W. Uh, w. Phelps and Joseph Smith that are called the Egyptian alphabet. And it's interesting because when he talks about um, the principles of astronomy being unfolded, he says he was with Oliver W.W. W. Phelps and he himself, and they were laboring on this alphabet and the principles of astronomy unfolded. So that's probably what he's talking about, probably those three documents. I mean, it could be something else, but the puzzle pieces fit together well, right? Yeah. In any case, um, so he, he has that, and then we get seemingly created after that, and this seems to be mostly by W.W. W. Phelps, who is absolutely nuts about language in every way you can mean nuts. Like, he's so excited about all forms of languages, and he has the craziest, weirdest ideas about them. I mean, he thinks he can translate um, uh, the Adamic language based on, like, three words that we know of it, right? So, I mean, he's just, he's crazy about it. He has crazy ideas, but he seems to, he, he creates, uh, and, and Joseph may have been involved in this. Uh, we know he's aware of it and, and looks at it from time to time, but uh, we don't know how involved. Maybe he's heavily involved. Maybe he's not involved at all. It seems like it's mostly a W.W. W. Phelps project, but anyway, um, he creates this larger thing that's called the grammar and alphabet of the Egyptian language. And many people have supposed that Joseph uses that to translate the book of Abraham. The problem is that it makes no sense at all. Um, it's certainly not from an Egyptian point of view. Now, it may make some sense from thinking about, you know, the ontology of things and so on, some more uh, abstract concepts, but uh, from a, tra a tool of translation, it, it, it doesn't make sense for that. Um, but again, if you look at a couple of kinds of documents, if you look at what the eyewitnesses said, they tell us Joseph Smith translated the first night before he's had any chance for, um, for creating an alphabet, right? He's translating immediately. No one ever says a word about him using those to translate. They talk about direct inspiration from heaven. So again, we're going to have to twist the eyewitnesses' words and wrest them away from what they're saying to make them say something else if we're going to, to say that. Additionally, and I've spent over the last year, uh, as I've been working on some articles and some books and things, I've spent untold hours trying to puzzle through, well, the last couple of years, but especially the last year, trying to puzzle through these documents. And it's very clear to me, you, 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 as, as you look at the different symbols and the way they're used in these, all these different documents, including in the, the earliest copies we have of the Book of Abraham, I, I think you can show that they are not used to translate. Well, you can't figure out what they are going to do. You can just figure out what they don't do. So from every way of, of trying to look at this 
from a, 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 a analytical perspective, those documents are somehow associated with the Book of Abraham, but they're not used to translate it, either from the historical sources or including the historical sources that are these alphabet and grammars. So that's not what's going on that's there. That's very helpful. Um, by the way, there are a lot of resources available. You don't have to you, you don't have to suffer in silence, so to speak, among all the arguments that are out there. There are some great sources to help you navigate this the complexity. The, that we're jumping into here with the Book of Abraham, and we'll put some links to some of those some of those books and, and web resources in the description below if you want to, to study a little deeper. Good, yeah, uh, and I find people often do, so that, that would be great if, if we did that. Okay. Um, one of the other questions people tend to have, and then let's jump into the doctrine, but sure. one of the other questions people tend to have, and maybe I'll just steal your scriptures here since they're open in the right spot, are the, the facsimiles, right? Um, because Joseph Smith, well, we don't know for sure that it's Joseph Smith that writes these explanations, uh, but one way or the other, he certainly approves of them. So uh, I'm, I'm just going to say Joseph Smith says this. Whether he was the author, he intends to say this by publishing it. Um, he gives us explanations of facsimile 1, of uh, facsimile 2, and facsimile 3, right? And uh, people tend to want to know uh, and this can get quite complex. We're going to give a very simplified version here, but people tend to want to know, did, does what Joseph Smith say match what they mean? What Joseph Smith, does Joseph Smith say what they mean match what the ancient Egyptians would have said they meant? And that's a problematic thing in, in two ways. All right, one, we don't have any ancient Egyptians handy to ask, right? It turns out they're all dead. So, um, the closest we can come is to ask someone like myself, an Egyptologist, all right? And again, the difficulty is that these documents are from about 200 BC, so by this time you have the kinds of characters and figures we see in here and these kinds of drawings, you have several thousand years of history of symbolic interpretation, and it changes over time. And we don't have as much documentation for this time as we do for, say, some other time periods. So just as an example, the, the the kind of drawing that is uh, facsimile 2 is, and we call it a hypocephalus. Which um, means behind the head. Yeah, that's right. It, it's designed to go under the head and give the person directions and light and ability to get where they want to be in the afterlife and be the kind of being they want to be in the afterlife. So, so you wouldn't have this on a pillow for a living person. No. You would have this on a pillow in a pyramid or in some yeah, in grave, a in a yeah, tomb. in a tomb. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, but this kind of, you see there are several figures in here, and uh, even among Egyptologists there was an agreement as to what they, they meant. There were some who said, okay, this figure means this and this figure means this, and some others who said this figure means this and this figure means this, uh, and so on. And so there was disagreement already. But then um, a good friend and colleague of mine at BYU, his name is John Gee, who has become one of the greatest experts on hypocephaly uh, in Egyptology, he finally found one where they actually labeled a number of those uh, characters, and it turns out that it was rare for the Egyptologists to, in either one of those camps, to be agreeing with what the ancient Egyptians from that time period were saying, right? So this just shows us that we can't just go and ask Egyptologists what an ancient Egyptian would have thought these meant because we, we may or may not be right. It's a complex process we're dealing with and we may or may not actually know. That's really profound that when, when John found that, that idea that, whoa, the, the consensus today turns out to not yeah. line up with yeah. what these... And there wasn't even a consensus. There were two different consensuses, right? And, and neither, neither one of them, of them are, are right. Are right most of the time. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's, that's, we need a little humility as academics to say sometimes we just can't figure this out, and, and that's worth knowing. So again, going back to those alphabet and grammars or the translation process, I have to say, I, or when he translated what, what the source was, I have to say, if I'm going to be honest, we can't tell. We don't have enough data to tell. That's important, and in this case, we don't have enough data to really compare well what the ancient Egyptians would have said these meant compared to what Joseph Smith said they meant. Now, in some cases, we can do a decent job or at least give it a, a very educated estimation or guess or, or, or treatise, and often it does match up well, like surprisingly often it matches up. I'm often surprised, like, oh, I didn't expect that to match so well, but it did. Um, so often it does match up well. But there's another problem. I'm not sure we're even asking the right question when we want to compare and say, did what Joseph Smith said these meant match what the ancient Egyptians would have said they meant? 
What if Joseph Smith was telling us what an, a group of ancient Jews would have said they meant? Right? So we know that Jews take Egyptian drawings, Egyptian stories, Egyptian elements of culture, and they give them their own interpretation. In fact, they often substitute Abraham for Osiris or Abraham for, for someone else in those scenes. Even Christ did that in the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. That's actually an Egyptian story, and he swapped Osiris for, for uh, Abraham in that story. Right? So uh, it's the kind of thing that we, we see happening quite a bit. So it's possible that that's what we should be saying is how would an ancient Jew in Egypt at the time have interpreted this? And the answer is we don't have enough data to know. It's also possible, remember I told you that there were groups of priests in Thebes at the time that this papyrus was, was created who were collecting stories uh, from, from Egyptian, I mean from Jewish religious figures and incorporating them into their own religious rites. And so they absolutely would have had a mixing of Egyptian and Jewish elements and, and drawn a different kind of interpretation out because of that. So since this is a priest in Thebes that owns these drawings, uh, at least facsimile one and two, we don't know uh, uh, as much about the one who owned facsimile three, or uh, sorry. Facsimile one and three. Yeah, it's an Egyptian priest who owns facsimile one and three. We don't know as much about the owner of facsimile two, but um, it's really a, a very good likelihood. From an academic perspective, we have to say there's a, a decent likelihood that he would have had an amalgamated or syncretistic interpretation of these drawings, meaning he would draw out uh, things that were influenced by both Egyptian and Jewish religious thought. But again, we don't have enough data to know what that would have been. Kerry, this is so helpful, this, this reminder that we need copious amounts of humility yeah. and meekness yeah. when we enter this discussion, because our assumptions, they're so potentially fraught with error at any one of these phases yeah. through history or from different cultures borrowing or reading in, it's, it's just very, very helpful. And, and frankly, these questions that arise with the Book of Abraham, a Book of Abraham studies and, and issues that people have and struggles they have, it really generally arises from what we'd say call hubris or mm -hmm. academic arrogance, feeling like we can say more and do more than we can, and, uh, and people are led away by that arrogance. And, uh, and that overreaching and overstating of academic abilities, whereas a dose of humility would be helpful for everyone. Um, and I'll, I'll also say it may be that Joseph Smith is just telling us what we should get out of them spiritually, regardless. It may be that he's, he is being, it's being revealed to him what he should teach the Latter-day Saints um, uh, and what they should learn from it. So in the end, again, we have to just admit we don't know. So, so at the end of that discussion, I think it, it kind of ties into the similar concept in the Book of Mormon, with the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, and you get that great passage in 2 Nephi 27, which contains more, more variation from its Isaiah equivalent in the Bible than any of, of our other Isaiah chapters in the Book of Mormon, and it's there where you get this coming forth of the book and the words of the book being given, and he's pretty careful how he separates out the book from the words of the book, the plates versus the translation. And then you get those two verses where God says, I am able to do mine own work. Yeah. And it's the academics of the world, the, 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 the intelligentsia, if you will, they, they can't explain it, but I, I'm able to do mine own work. I, I got this. Yeah. And I think we need to bring some of that into the book of Abraham as well as God's voice echoing in the back of our mind with him saying, I, I know what I'm doing, yeah. and I yeah. know how to do this when it comes to Scripture. And, and I think that's where I've, I've written about this several times, the idea that, that we should recognize our different avenues of learning, value them all, but recognize what they're capable of doing. So there are several different avenues of learning, but let's compare kind of the academic method with the revelatory method, right? We should pursue both. Absolutely, God tells us to study in our heart and our mind and by, by studying faith and all sorts of other things, right? Um, but we need to recognize the limitations we've just talked about with the academic method, and if we're trying to figure out the things of God, the academic method can only take us so far, and that's not very far. If you want to find out the things of God, at least Paul teaches us, you better learn it from God. It doesn't make any sense to the world. It only makes sense if it comes from God, and, uh, and that's the method that can teach us those things that the academic method is not prepared to give us, and so both can help us understand the book of Abraham, 
but one is going to, only one is going to be able to help us understand the truth of the book of Abraham. The other is not capable. So with that, then, maybe we should talk about other things we can learn from the book of Abraham. Yeah, I, I was just going to say that that's a beautiful segue into, okay, so let's assume that we don't have the book of Abraham. Let's assume that we don't know anything about that process and it's just not part of our history. What did we just lose? Oh, so what much. just went out the door? So much. Um, in particular, so I'll say there are two things that we talk about from the book of Abraham more than anything else, but then I kind of like to maybe summarize it in some ways. One is what it teaches us about premortality. Probably our, our most clear teachings about premortality are from Abraham chapter 3 mm -hmm. and about the Abrahamic covenant. We learn some really key uh, understandings and understand the Abrahamic covenant better because we have this, right? Now, both of those have actually been discussed in earlier lessons, right? You've already done Abraham 3 uh, at the beginning of the year. We just, in part one of this, did uh, the Abrahamic covenant, but still, let's, let's see if we can kind of put it together in some interesting ways. All right, so if we go to Abraham chapter 1, and I'm just going to summarize some of these things, and you jump in as much as you would like. We spent tons of time on Abraham 1 and 2 in the lesson, part 1 of this lesson, but still, let's summarize it. We've got Abraham seeking for a covenant, recognizing that there's something more for him, and he needs to get it from God, seeking for it and finding it. And remember how he says it, I've sought thee, and now I have found thee. It's all about him finding God or his relationship with God, right? Included in there is the fact that within this relationship, God will support him and protect him. He'll, and as we said, there are some people he supports and protects in a different way. He lets them die, but I think he supports and protects them in the hereafter. But in this covenant relationship, he's, he's leading Abraham by the hand, almost literally, not quite, but almost, as he takes him off of an altar, brings him into um, a, a, a promised land, takes him down to Egypt, back into that promised land, right? All of this is about Abraham and having that relationship with God. We get the establishment of the covenant in chapter 2, which is really in-depth about the covenant um, and about God leading them after they've had this covenant. And I, I'll just say this, we didn't have uh, time to go to it in, into it even more in-depth in the um, in the part one of this, but in, in my mind, and I've studied the covenant really intensively for years, and I've written lots on it, the core central element of the Abrahamic covenant is our relationship with God. That's the purpose of establishing it. It's what, why God did it. It is all about creating that relationship, and then, of course, the core element in that is that God loves us, and our primary responsibility is to love God right? That's, that's the core, relationship with God, loving God, and him loving us, all right? So, so far, we've seen that happening quite a bit. Then we get Abraham chapter 3, wonderful, complex sub subject that I know you've talked about before, but let me just— If you have an infinite switch in your mind, you want to turn it on when you that's start right. reading chapter 3, because <laughs> it gets right. big really fast. And, and uh, so, everyone should go and, and look at that episode again, but I'll just give you the kind of Cliff Notes version. Abraham is told by God— that he wants him to teach some things in Egypt, and he, first of all, will teach him about astronomy. And when he's teaching him about astronomy, he says, you've got um, orbiting bodies, and uh, any time you have an orbiting body that's one that's greater than it and one that's lower than it, until you get to God, or Kolob, which is next to God, that's the greatest of them all, all right? So he teaches them this about astronomy, and then he says, now I want you to teach them what I really want you to teach them is what I think, I use that as a model or an example or an allegory or whatever you'd like to call it to teach them about our relationship with each other and God, because he says, just like for every orbiting body, there's one above it and one below it, for every intelligence, and he will define intelligence later, uh, you know, as uh, doing what God asks, and we can combine that with uh, section 93 and others, and I think we can get this idea of, of light and truth, okay? So the amount of light and truth we have determines our intelligence, as it were. So we're not talking synaptic relapses firing in the brain and IQs and that kind of thing. We're talking light and truth. The amount you're like God in terms of light and truth is a brief summary of that, all right? So just as with every planet, there's one above it and one below it, so it is with intelligences. For every intelligence, there is one above and one below. Then let's at least read verse 19. This is the, the key here. And the Lord said unto me, These two facts do exist, that there are two spirits, one being more intelligent than the other. There shall be another more intelligent than they. I am the Lord thy God. I am more intelligent than they all. all right? So, this establishes that relationship again, right? It's a little bit like we said when, when uh, in the previous episode, part one, 
when you're establishing the covenant, you say, okay, we're having a, we're binding ourselves together, but let's be clear. I am God. I created the heavens and the earth. You're Abraham. We're going to be bound together, but we're not, I'm, I'm higher here, right? I, I have the ability to bind you and bring you up to someplace you're not already at. That's what the covenant's about. And really, that's what we're going to see chapter three is about. So the first thing he establishes <clears throat> is that he is more intelligent than they are. He has all light and truth, right? He's above all of us, right? So Abraham can go and teach Pharaoh, who is seen as semi-divine and everything else. By the way, there is someone above you. You may be above some others. There's someone above you, just to let you know, Pharaoh. Um, but note where this goes immediately. After Abraham teaches him that, he then shows Abraham the intelligences that were organized before the world was. This is that pre-mortality. He says there are some who are noble and great, and Abraham is one of them. And then Abraham sees this vision where there is one that's like unto God. This would be Christ. And he says, we will go down, for there is space there. This is verse 24. And we will take of these materials, and we will make an earth whereon these may dwell, and we will prove them herewith to see if they will do all things whatsoever the Lord their God shall command them. So we're going to give them space. We're going to give them light and truth and see if they act on it. And then he tells us what happens if they do or don't act on it in the next verse. And they who keep their first estate shall be added upon. And they who keep not their first estate shall not have glory in the same kingdom with those who keep their first estate. And they who keep their second estate shall have glory added upon their heads forever and ever. So know what he's saying, and, and this is, we sometimes disconnect this from this whole business with the this planets and the intelligences, but it's not. It's part of the same thing, right? So I think what he's just said is that, okay, if there are planets and there's always one above every planet till you get to the one where I am, and there are intelligences, right, these, and it's these orbits of these planets and their rotations we're, we're concerned about, there are intelligences, and there's always one above another till you get to me, I'm more intelligent than they all, but the point is... I'm giving you a planet to dwell on and giving you an opportunity to gain more and more, or in other words, to jump orbits. This is almost a chemistry phrase, but, uh, but to jump orbits until you can get to where I am. I'll give you more light and truth or glory is the phrase he uses in, in, in verse 26, but more light and truth or glory forever and ever really implying, and you can keep gaining glory until you come to where I am, that you can, you can gain, uh, my orbit. He encapsulates that in the phrase in verse 26, and they who keep their first estate mm -hmm. shall be added upon. Right. You're not the same. You're, right. You're, you're, you're jumping orbit. You're added upon. It's right. powerful. So now I want you to, let's, let's think of what we've said has been the theme of each chapter. And by the way, he then will start to explain creation, and that's what chapters four and five are. Um, and, and we do get some key elements in there that it's that creation than by, than... by uh, committee almost, right? Yeah. The, the, the noble and great ones. Yeah, there's some additions in 4 and 5's creation account in Abraham that you don't get anywhere else. Yeah. The, the gods organizing the heavens yeah. and the earth and watching, watching the elements until they obeyed. Yeah. Th these, are, these are beautiful additions to our perspective. They are. But let's kind of summarize. If we, I was going to say, and it took me a long time of teaching this and writing about this to finally realize what was staring me in the face the whole time, and that is if I were to summarize what chapter 1 is about, it's about Abraham's relationship with God. If I were to summarize what chapter 2 is about and, and the establishment of the covenant, it's about Abraham's relationship with God. If I were to summarize what chapter 3 is about, it's about our relationship with God and our ability to join him there. I'm, I'm seeing a pattern here. There may Let be, me guess, right? chapter 4? <laughs> yeah, well, again, that God created this earth for us for so us. that what ha he talked about in chapter 3 can happen, or in other words, we can grow and, and have a higher, holder relationship with God. It is all about how God wants us to become like him so we can have a closer relationship with him. That's the overwhelming and overarching theme of the book of Abraham. So from a, from a complete non-Egyptologist perspective, I love this. I love this idea of bring it down to its simple, rudimentary, foundational level, what's really going on here, and I love that conclusion, to the point where if you look at the three facsimiles, I love the fact that facsimile one, you've got this, this square, and in other places, the, the square, the four corners, um, and I have no idea if this fits into Egyptian uh, perspective. Four, usually in the scriptures, 
denotes the earth, mortality, the four corners of the earth, the four quarters of the earth, the every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. It often comes to you in fours when it's referring to earth and mortality. Uh, interesting what's portrayed there, Abraham on an altar. We come to this earth and we experience death, um, and in this case he's preserved from it, but he will die, and all of the opposition that's contained in mortality portrayed there. To me, this is an overview, the, these three facsimiles, of our journey back to God, our perspective of who he is, who we are, and what he's doing for us to deliver us from the struggles. Then you get that hypocephalus, the second facsimile, this often the circle, and ironically this isn't a perfect circle, right? I've been told that it might represent like a rising sun in Egypt, it's, mm, it's slightly likely. elliptical, it's not a perfect circle, the rising of the sun in death and the hypocephalus, you've got your cheat sheet of how to how to know all of the keywords that you need to progress, mm -hmm. add it upon, kingdom to kingdom, so to speak. So you get earth represented by the four square, you've got usually the circle represents the eye of God or eternities or the heavens, heaven and earth come together, it's beautiful with the Savior and his infinite atonement being portrayed, which then brings us to what? We're, we die, we're ro uh, we raise from the dead, this hypocephalus idea with all of those key words, and then what do you get? An enthronement scene in number three, exaltation, entering into a, a crowning where you're, you become a, a king. He's sitting on Pharaoh's throne. It's the symbolism of, of our journey of what God is trying to do with us. I, everything that Carrie has just said to me as a layperson with no Egyptian expertise at all, to be able to even see in the pictures that God is telling me a story of he's, he's bringing me through the process of sacrifice and the opposition of the world. He'll give me everything. I, I, I can trust him. He's not going to leave me in the grave. He's not going to leave me hanging with my soul being sent down to be an angel to the devil in hell. I'm going to be given that opportunity to be exalted someday. Good, and, and let me maybe even add to that just a little bit, because I, I love that and I agree with what you're doing. Let's just add to it a little bit. This is what we would call an archetypal journey, a journey that is about our journey to be with God again, right? So let's look in terms of uh, the the one of the greatest archetypal journeys, which is in the temple, or we don't talk about our temple so much, but we can talk about the tabernacle or the Temple of Solomon, right? First thing you encounter when you come into the courtyard is an altar, right? Then then you have a laver and stuff that, that makes you clean, and then you come into the holy place. That's the next thing, right? So this is in the here. Let's just draw this. This is the way. outer courtyard. Yeah, that's in the courtyard, and then you come to the the building itself, the tabernacle or the temple, right? And uh, what you encounter in here, you've got the menorah and, and showbread and uh, altar of incense, but the idea is that you, you go up, and, and in the Temple of Solomon, you did go up. You actually ascended to a higher, this is a different sacred, this is more sacred than this space, all right? Now, you can't even come in here if you haven't made a covenant. Only covenant holders can come in here, and when they come in here, they sacrifice, and symbolically, they partake of the sacrifice of the Lord, right? And that, and the washing and so on, allows them to become more holy who have jumped orbits, as it were, so that they can come into a holier place, which is symbolic then not of this world, like this stuff is, and this is kind of this world. This is a, this is a higher world, right? This is a different world, and we journey through this higher, holier world, and then we get into where the Ark of the Covenant is in the Holy of Holies, but the Ark of the Covenant is thought of as the throne of God, all right? So now let's think in these terms again. Uh, you, in, in fact, simply one is an altar. It's about sacrifice and being saved by the power of God. Then you get to this hypocephalus, which is really about a journey, all right, a journey in, in the afterlife in a holier, a different place, and when you're done with that journey, you come to the enthronement scene, as you said, right? Um, and it's, it's really the same thing. Uh, the, the same story that our temple tells us, and it's interesting because Joseph Smith keeps talking about how this is about the temple, right? Everything in here, you'll yeah. find it in the temple, you'll yeah. find it in the temple. It's, 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 uh, that's because they're both about the same journey, the journey that Christ enables us to make, right? Here's that, that altar, that emphasis on Christ, the, the journey that Christ enables us to make, 
that will bring us jumping orbit, jumping orbit, jumping orbit to where we can be with and be more like God. And, and maybe I can also um, say this, Tyler, that, um, you know, we spent the first bit of this little episode talking about all sorts of questions and, and so on. We wanted to know the history, but also questions people have. Um, and we talked about different avenues for learning. Mm -hmm. And I would plead with anyone, whether you have questions about the book of Abraham or anything that you have questions about, pursue both avenues of learning. But what I find is that so often people pursue the academic method, and when they're doing that, they stop the, the revelatory method. If you will do what we've done here, which is at the end, we're going through the doctrine, the text and the doctrine. Pursue every other method of learning that you want to pursue, but at the same time, pursue this. Read the text. Read these doctrines we've been talking about. Read what it teaches you about how you can be with God. If you're doing that, I believe you'll experience the revelatory method. You're so foolish to pursue one and not the other, right? It's, I just can't imagine why anyone would do that, but that's typically what happens. Never, ever, ever stop pursuing this method and reading and studying the text and the doctrines, and you'll get your answers. From pursuing both, you'll get your answers, but don't give up on this while you're doing the other. You know, that same, that exact same principle could apply to your approach to the Book of Mormon. Yes. Because there are a lot of people who make a lot of claims about the Book of Mormon without ever actually immersing in the book itself. They're just immersing in what other people have said about it or what they, what they assume to be true about it without actually diving into it. The same thing applies to the Bible. As time has progressed and as we've learned more and more about ancient societies and ancient languages and cultures and customs, the Bible has come under greater scrutiny, and that has caused some people to completely abandon their faith in God, their belief in, in anything divine, because they find some inconsistencies or some struggles with the way the Bible comes to us today. And Carrie, I love what you've done. You've shown the same thing for the Bible as the book of Abraham. We don't have all of the answers. We don't know all of the, the whys and the wherefores of how we even got the book in any of these cases, but we have the book, and it would be, like you said, foolish yeah. to ignore reading the book and just read what the world's experts would tell us about the book and about where it came from rather than diving into it and trying to, to apply those principles that we've learned to our own life. Yeah, yeah, I would say take a lesson from Joseph Smith, who pursued all sorts of avenues of learning, but he went and asked God. If you want to learn about the things of God, ask God, and, and do it his way, not your way. So to finish up, again, this is, this is a unique opportunity to have Kerry and his expertise uh, with us today. Um, I want to finish with just one question for you, Kerry. Mm -hmm. We've talked about a lot of things that we don't know, a lot of uncertainties. Could you now just summarize to, to conclude, and perhaps even with your testimony of what do you absolutely know without any question when it comes to this book of Abraham? I am grateful that you've asked that question. So I can say from using my intellectual uh, abilities and academic training, I can know all sorts of stuff about plausibilities, probabilities, and so on, but uh, with none of that am I able to fully know even things that we would like to know, just like history of the text and that kind of a thing, right? Trivial things we can't even fully figure out. The things that I know absolutely, I know because they've been revealed to me, and I find that to be the more reliable and better source for learning these kinds of things. And what I know is that God loves us, that he wants us to return to be with him, and so he is willing to bind himself to us through covenant and carry us, and he sent his son to make that possible. I know that his son is both the messenger of the covenant and, in a way, the covenant itself. That's what the scriptures tell us. He's the one that makes it possible for the covenant to be fulfilled so that we are then bound with to God and we can eventually become greater than we are, have more light and truth than we have, and be united with God again, all because he loves us so much that he sent his only begotten son, and that I really do know and can testify of in the name of that only begotten son, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Know that you're loved. Yeah.